This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Voodoo Planet by Andre Norton. Chapter 8 Vaguely aware that the clamor at the other end of the camp had died away, Dane muted the sound of his drum. Over its round top he could watch the Kotkin outlaws, their heads bobbed and swayed in time to the beat of his fingers. He, too, could feel the pull of Tao's voice. But what would come in answer? That shadowy thing which had been loose to drive them here? Or the man himself? To Dane the ruddy light of the fire dimmed, yet there was no actual dying of those flames which coiled and thrust around the wood and the acrid scent of burning was thick. How much of what followed was real, how much the product of his tense nerves, Dane was never afterwards able to tell. In fact, whether all the witnesses there saw the same sights could be questioned. Did each man, Kotkin and Offworlder, see only what his particular set of emotions and memories dictated? Something swept in from the east something which was not as tangible as the creature born of swamp mist. Rather, it came as an unseen menace to the fire, and all that fire signifies to humankind, security, comradeship, a weapon against the age-old forces of the dangerous night. Was that threat, too, only in their minds? Or had Lombrilo some power to shape his hatred? The unseen was cold. It sapped a man's strength, bit at his brain, weighted his hands and feet, weakened him. It strove to soften him into clay another could remold. Nothingness, darkness, all that was opposed to life and warmth and reality arose in the night, gathered together against them. Yet still Tao fronted that invisible wave, his head high, and between his sturdily planted feet the knife gleamed bright with a radiance of its own. Ah! Tao's voice curled out to pierce that creeping menace. Then he was singing again, the cadence of his unknown words rising a little above the pattern wrought by the drum. Dane forced his heavy hands to continue the beat, his wrists to rise and fall in defiance of that which crept to eat their strength and make them less than men. Lombrilo! I, Tau, of another star, another sky, another world, bid you come forth and range your power against mine. Now there was a sharper note in that demand, the snap of an order. He was answered by another wave of the black negation, stronger, rolling up to smash them down, as a wave in the heavy surf of a wild ocean pounds its force against the beach. This time Dane thought he could see that dark mass. He tore his eyes away before it took on substance, concentrating on the movements of his hands against the drumhead, refusing to believe that hammer of power was rising to flatten them all. He had heard Tao describe such things in the past, but told in familiar quarters on board the Queen such experiences were only stories. Here was danger unleashed. Yet the medic stood unbowed as the wave broke upon him in full. And, advancing under the crest of that lick of destruction, came its controller. This was no ghost drawn from the materials of the swamp. This was a man, walking quietly, his hands as empty as Tao's, yet grasping weapons none of them could see. In the firelight, as the wave receded sullenly, Men moaned, lay face down upon the ground, beat their hands feebly against the earth. But as Lombrilo came on from the shadows, one of them got to his hands and knees, moved with small tortured jerks. He crawled toward Tao, his head lolling on his shoulders as the head of the dead rock-ape had done. 
Dane patted the drum with one hand, while with the other he groped for his fire-ray. He tried to shout in warning and found that he could not utter a sound. Tao's arm moved, raised from his side, made a circling motion. The creeping man, his eyes rolled up in his head until only the whites gleamed blindly in the limited light, followed that gesture. He drew level with the medic, passed beyond toward Lumbrillo, whining as a hound prevented from obeying his master might lament. "'So be it, Lumbrillo,' Tao said. "'This is between you and me. Or do you dare to risk your power against mine?' Is Lumbrillo so weak a one that he must send another to do his will? Raising both hands again, the medic brought them down, curling inward, until he stooped and touched them to the ground. When he straightened, once again the knife was in his grasp, and he tossed it behind him. The smoke from the fire swirled out in a long tongue, coiled about Lumbrillo, and was gone. A black-and-white beast stood where the man had been, its tufted tail lashing, its muzzle a mask of snarling hate and bloodlust. But Tao met that transformation with laughter which was like the lash of a whip. "'We both be men, you and I, Lumbrillo. Meet me as a man and keep those trickeries for those who have not the clear sight. A child plays as a child, so—' Tao's voice came in a rumble, but Tao was gone. The huge hairy thing which swayed in his place turned a gorilla's beast visage to his enemy. For a breathless moment, Terran ape confronted Kotkin lion. Then the spaceman was himself again. The time for games is over, man of Kotka. You have tried to hunt us to our deaths, have you not? Therefore death shall be the portion of the loser now. Lion vanished. Man stood watching, alertly, as swordsmen might face swordsmen with a blood feud lying on their blades. To Dane's eyes the Kotkin made no move. Yet the fire leaped high, as if freshly fed, and flames burst from the wood, flew into the air red and perilous birds darting at Tao until they outlined him from the ground under his boots to an arch over his head. They united and spun faster until Dane, watching with dazzled eyes, saw the wheel become a blur of light, hiding Tao with its fiery core. His own wrists ached with the strain of his drumming as he lifted one hand and tried to shield his sight from the glare of that pillar of fire. Lumbrillo was chanting a heavy blast of words. Dane stiffened. His traitorous hands were falling into the rhythm of that other song. Straightaway he raised both from the drumhead, brought them down in a discordant series of thumps which bore no relation to either the song Tao wanted or that which Lumbrillo was now crooning. Thump, 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 Dane beat it out frantically, belaboring the drumhead as he wanted to sink his fists home on the body of the Kotkin witch-doctor. The pillar of fire swayed, fluttered as if a wind drove it, and was gone. Tao, unmarked, smiled. Fire! He pointed his fingers at Lombrillo. Would you try earth and water and air also, wizard? Call hither your whirlwind, up your flood, summon the land to quake. None of those shall bring me down. Shapes came flooding out of the night some monstrous, some human, streaming past Lumbrillo to crowd into the circle of firelight. Some Dane thought he knew, some were strangers, men wearing space uniforms or the dress of other worlds, women, they strode, wept, mingled with the monsters to laugh, curse, threaten. Dane guessed that Lumbrillo sent now against the Terran the harvest of the medic's own memories. He shut his eyes against this enforced intrusion upon another's past, but not before he saw Tao's face, strained, fine to the well-shaped bones beneath the thin flesh, holding still a twisted smile as he met each memory, accepted the pain it held for him, and set it aside unshaken. "'This too has no power any longer,' 
man who walks in the dark. Dane opened his eyes. Those crowding wraiths were fading, losing substance. Lombrido crouched, his lips drawn back from his teeth, his hatred plain to read. I am not clay to be molded by your hands, Lombrilo, and now I say that the time has come to call an end. Tau raised his hands slowly once again, holding them away from his body, palms pointing earthward, and beneath them, on either side of the spaceman, two black shadows gathered on the surface of the ground. You have fettered yourself with your own bounds. As you have been the hunter, so shall you now be the hunted. Those shadows were growing as plants might issue from the packed soil of the camping ground. When his hands were shoulder-high, Tao held them steady. Now, on either side of his tautly held body, crouched one of the black-and-white lions with which Lombrilo had identified his own brand of magic throughout the year. Lombrilo's lion had been larger than life, more intelligent, more dangerous, subtly different from the normal animal it counterfeited. So now were these, and both of them raised their heads to gaze intently into the medic's face. "'Hunt well, brothers in fur,' he said slowly, almost caressingly. "'Him who you hunt shall grant you sport in the going.' "'Stop it!' A man leaped from the shadows behind the witch-doctor. Firelight made plain his off-world dress, and he swung up a blaster, aiming at the nearest of the waiting beasts. That flash struck true, but it neither killed nor even singed the fine fur of the animal's pelt. As the blaster's aim was swung from beast to man, Dane fired first. His ray brought a scream from the other, who dropped his weapon from a badly seared hand to reel back, cursing. Tao waved his hands gently. The great animal heads turned obediently, until the red eyes were set on Lombrilo. Facing them, the witch-doctor straightened, spat out his hate at the medic. "'I do not run to be hunted, devil-man!' "'I think you do, Lombrilo, for you must taste fear now as you have made other men drink of it, so that it fills your blood and races through your body, clouds your mind to make of you less than a man. You have hunted out those who doubted your power, who stood in your chosen path, whom you wanted to remove from the earth of Katka. Do you doubt that they wait in the last dark for you now, ready to greet you, witch-doctor? What they have known, you shall also know. This night you have shown me all that lies in my past that is weak, that is evil, that I may regret or find sorrow for. So shall you also remember through the few hours left you. Ay, you shall run, Lombrilo. As he spoke, Tau approached the other, the two black-and-white hunters pacing beside him. Now he stooped and caught up a pinch of soil and spat upon it three times. Then he threw the tiny clod of earth at the witch-doctor. It struck Lombrilo just above the heart, and the man reeled under what might have been a murderous blow. The Kotkin broke then completely. With a wailing cry he whirled and ran, crashing into the brush as one who runs blindly and without hope. Behind him the two beasts leaped noiselessly together, and all three were gone. Tau swayed, put his hand to his head. Dane kicked away the drum, arose from his cramped position stiffly to go to him. But the medic was not yet done. He returned to stand over the prostrate native hunters, and he clapped his hands sharply. "'You are men, and you shall act as men henceforth. That which was is no longer. Stand free, for the dark power follows him who misused it, and fear no longer eats from your basins, drinks from your cups, or lies beside you on the sleep mats. Tau! Jellicoe's shout reached them over the cries of the rousing Kotkins. But Dane was there first, catching the medic before he slumped to the ground. But he was dragged with that dead weight until he sat with the medic's head on his shoulder, the other's body resting heavily against him. 
For one horror-filled moment Dane feared that he did indeed hold a dead man, that one of the outlaw hunters must have struck a last blow for his discredited leader. Then Tao sighed and began to breathe deeply. Dane glanced up, amazed at the captain. "'He's asleep!' Jellico knelt and his hand went to test heartbeat, then to touch the medic's worn and dirty face. "'Best thing for him,' he said briskly. "'He's had it.' It took some time to get the facts of their triumph sorted out. Two of the off-worlder poachers were dead. The other and the spaceman were prisoners, while Naimani rounded up in addition the man Dane had burned to save Tau. When the younger spaceman returned from making the medic comfortable in the shelter, he found Asaki and Jellico holding an impromptu court of inquiry. The dazed native hunters had been expertly looped together by Naimani, and a little apart from them the offworlders were under examination. "'An I see man, eh?' Jellico, smoothing a mud-spattered chin with a grimed hand, regarded the latest arrival measuringly. "'Trying to run in and break a combine charter, were you? You'd better spill the facts. Your own head office will disown you. You ought to know that. They never back any failures in these undercover deals.' "'I want medical attention,' snapped the other, cradling his seared hand to his chest. "'Or do you plan to turn me over to these savages?' "'Seeing as how you tried to blast our medic,' replied the captain, with a grin which was close to shark-like, "'he may not feel much like patching up those fingers of yours. Stick him in where they have no business, and they're apt to get burned. At any rate, he's not going to look at him until he's had a chance to rest. I'll give you first aid, and while I'm working, we'll talk. I see going into the poaching trade now. That news is going to please Combine.' They have no use for you boys, anyway." His answer was lurid and uninformative. But the uniform tunic the other wore could not be so easily explained away. Dane, worn out, stretched his aching length on a pile of mats and lost all interest in the argument. Two days later they stood once more on the same terrace where Lombrillo had wrought his magic and met his first defeat. This time no lightning played along the mountain ridges, and the blaze of the sun was so bright and clear that one could hardly believe in the fantastic happenings of that swamp clearing where men had fought with weapons not made by hands. The three from the Queen moved away from the parapet to meet the chief ranger as he came down the stairs. A messenger has just arrived. The hunter was hunted indeed, and his going was witnessed by many though they did not see those which hunted him. Lombrillo is dead. He came to his end by the great river. Jellico started. But that is almost fifty miles from the swamp, on this side of the mountain. He was hunted and he fled, as you promised, Asaki said to Tao. You made strong magic, off-world man. The medic shook his head slowly. I but turned his own methods against him. Because he believed in his power, that same power, reflected back, broke him. Had I been facing one who did not believe... He shrugged. Our first meeting set the pattern. From that moment he feared a little that I could match him, and his uncertainty pierced a hole in his armor. "'Why on earth did you want Terra bound burst out Dane, still seeking an explanation for that one small mystery among the others. Tao chuckled. In the first place, that blasted tune has haunted us all for so long that I knew its rhythm was probably the one you could keep to without hardly knowing that you were beating it out. And in the second place, its alien pattern was a part of our particular background, to counteract Lombrillo's native Kotkin music, which was certainly a big factor in his stage setting. He must have believed that we would not find out about the drugged water and so would be prepared for any fantasy he cared to produce. When they saw us coming out of the swamp, they counted us easy takings. His practice had always been with Kotkins, and he judged us by their reactions to stimuli he knew well how to use. So he failed. Asaki smiled. 
which was good for Katka, but ill for Lombrilo and those using him to make mischief here. The poacher and the outlaw hunters will meet with our justice, which I do not believe they will relish. But the other two, the spaceman and the company agent, are to be sent to Zekko to face combine authorities. It is my thought that those will not accept kindly the meddling of another company in their territory." Jellico grunted. Kindness and combine are widely separated in such matters. But we can now take passage on the same ship as your prisoners. But, my friend, you have not yet seen the preserve. I assure you that this time there shall be no trouble. We have several days yet before you must return to your ship." The captain of the Queen held up his hand. "'Nothing would give me greater pleasure than to inspect the Zaboro Preserve, sir, next year. As it is, my holiday is over and the Queen is waiting for us on Zekko. Also, permit me to send you some tapes dealing with the newest types of flitters, guaranteed against flight failures. Yes, guaranteed, Tao added guilelessly, not to break down, lose course, or otherwise disrupt a pleasant excursion. The chief ranger threw back his head, and his deep-chested laughter was echoed from the heights above them. Very well, Captain. Your mail run will bring you back to Zekko at intervals. Meanwhile, I shall study your sales tapes concerning the non-expendable flitters. But you shall visit Zoboru. And pleasantly, very pleasantly, I assure you, Medic Tau. I wonder, Tau muttered, and Dane heard. Just now, the quiet of deep space is a far, far more entrancing proposition. End of Voodoo Planet by Andre Norton. This recording is in the public domain.